Good morning, church. Good. Uh, le let's, uh, today, um, let's do something, not, not something differently. Today is a continuation of our study. Uh, I, I didn't tell you guys that we're doing a series, but it just turns out that it turns out to be a series. Uh, the f two weeks ago, we, we did a teaching on if you abide in me and I abide in you, whatever you ask of your desires, I will give. That was, I think, John 15, 7. And then last week, we did a study on if you abide in my word, in my word, and my word abides in you. So God changed from the one he changed that abide in me to abiding in my word. Today, we will be talking about abiding in my love. Abiding in my love. So we've, I've done a detailed, uh, I, I did some kind of a brief introduction as to uh, defining what it means to abide and all those things. So at least you can pick it back from those notes for, for the sake of uh, timing. I will not go through that. So this morning, we will be talking about abiding in my love. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, in the mighty name of your Son, O oh God, we thank you, Lord. We worship you, we bless you, we exalt you, we glorify thy name. We acknowledge this morning that you, Lord, you're the King of kings. You're the author, the finisher of our faith. Thank you, Father, for bringing us into your presence. Mighty and everlasting God, we ask this morning for the forgiveness of sins. If, if my people call by my name will humble themselves and will seek your face, you will hear from your throne of grace, O God, Father, and you will forgive us our sins, and you will heal us. This morning, O God, Father, as we come before you, O God, Father, with a heart of humility, we pray, Holy Spirit, O God, have mercy. Have mercy, O God, Father, upon us. And Lord, I pray in the name of your Son. Then you hear what he said, for God so loved the world. And you gave your only begotten son this morning, oh God, as, as we delve into this love, if you abide in my love, I pray, oh Holy Spirit, that as we leave these teachings today, we'll have a better understanding of that love, how to abide in that love. Help our understanding, oh God, Father, my Lord, I pray you open up our hearts that we can receive these words this morning. Speak to the one that needs to be spoken to. Touch the one that needs a special touch. Heal the one that needs healing this morning. Pay the bills for the one that needs bills to be paid, oh God. Bring back that child that has gone wayward, oh God, Father, for that family that is crying for that wayward child. Answer your people's prayers this morning, oh Lord. Thank you, faithful Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So this morning, as I said, we're talking about abiding in love, abide in God's love. And, and we'll we pick up from John 15, 9. John 15, 9. Let me read that from here. John 15, 9. I, John 15, 9 says, says this. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my word. Now, for those of you who have been following us, our teachings have been on that uh, John 15 down to about um, down to about 16 or 17. There are about you got three things: abiding in God, abiding in His Word, and today is abiding in His love. I have not read all of those uh, verses. I want you to go back and read those verses. But this morning we'll focus on abiding in my love, and we'll address four or five. Let's say about six questions. Question number one: Why will Jesus command you and I to abide in his love. Why will he do that? Question number two, what are some of the basic truths that you and I need to know about God asking us to abide in his love? Question number three, what does it mean to abide in God's love? Question number four, what are some of the misconceptions? We hear a lot that God loves us unconditionally. Is there some misconceptions, if there are? What are some of those misconceptions when it comes to this idea of God loving us unconditionally? What are the benefits in abiding in God's love? If I abide in God, God's love, what are some of the benefits that I do enjoy? And finally, how can I 
abide in God's love. Those are uh, with this if time will permit us, and I hope we should, we'll quickly go through this this these six uh things or six questions. And so John 15, 9, this is God, uh, John writing, say, as the Father loved me, this is Jesus Christ talking, as the Father, the Father in heaven loved him, Jesus, I have also loved you. And then he goes on with the, this command, abide in my love. Yes, you have a command? Can I uh, get the mic here, yeah, please? Abide in my love. Yes. Is it possible to abide in God's love and still have hatred inside of you? The, 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 true. It's a very tricky question. Now, when I say not tricky, is it possible that I can abide in God's love and still have hatred in you? See, love should overshadow that hatred and all and that. But the point here is, the, 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 the way I will answer that question is, if there's a sense of hatred, at least he recognizes it, God has not called us to perfection. I want to be clear on that. To say that because I have Christ, I can no longer sin. Right? We are not to sin. It will happen. Perfection, the world of perfection will come when we meet face to face with God. So there's a possibility that I can love God, abide in God's love, and they still hatred in me. Why? Ignorance of that God's love. I don't even truly know how it manifests. Right? A lot of us read the Bible. There are things in the Bible that you ask us, so why do you see do that? Because ignorance. But again, I have said, ignorance is not an exemption or an excuse from the consequences of it. So there is a possibility. But then you recognize it. At what point do you recognize that there's hatred in you? Is it prior to you coming to that knowledge of the love of God? And if so, what do I do to get rid of that hatred? Thanks for that. Yes. Yes. Good. True. Let's let. Okay. Let's uh get another comment and please uh let, let's let's quicken that that way we can get through this. Uh. Oh, I thought you had a, a, a question, a comment. And, and that is true. So let's just, yes, we 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 were sinners. Then we were sinners, and that's why God died for us to bring us out of darkness into light. If left to ourselves, we would deviate more so to sinful activities. Right. So let's get back to this thing. Again, we're talking today about abiding. We've talked. I've taught you guys already what it means to abide. To abide means to stay. To, to, to not walk away is to, to, to be oneness, to, to be in unity, in communion. That's what means to abide, to abide here, to stay put, to stay in this position. Don't move away from here. Don't walk away from here. To abide means to accept or ac uh, act in accordance with God's word, right? It, it, it means to submit to or to agree to God's word. That said, uh, I quickly told you guys that one of the pastors would turn around and define abide as 
A, standing for aware of our great need for Christ. B, stood for belief wholeheartedly and absolutely that Christ can save us. He would put I to be inquire of God's truth and his word. D stood for to depend on Christ, not to depend on self, but to depend on Christ. And E stood for exercise our faith in Christ. So, that said, after establishing that, that abide means to stay, not to go away, to, to remain, to, to be glued into God's love. Let's begin by asking ourselves, why will God ask you and I to abide in his love? Answer number one. We are humans, we do know. We are humans. And we do not understand. We, he knew that we do not have a good understanding of this idea of unconditional love. He knew we cannot exercise this unconditional love. And I use it in quote because I talked about the misconception about uh, unconditional love. We are humans. We, 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 we don't know how to extend love to people regardless of situations. We, 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 we just cannot fathom that idea. Talk to somebody out there in the world that Jesus Christ died for us. Like, what are you talking about? That somebody would die for me? They, don't, they cannot fathom that idea. So that idea is nearly impossible. Romans 8.35, Romans 8.38 through 39. This thing that nothing can separate us from the love of God. They just don't get that idea. It's like, what are you talking about? And by the way, when they say nothing can separate us from the lo love of God, I just want to quote this thing. Sins will separate us from the love of God. Just be, let's be very careful with that. Because those are some of the things we throw out out there. We, he, he knows that we understand, we, he understands our human pro propensity, the, our human ability or likeness to walk away, to turn our backs, uh, to be to deny. How many of us here, somebody steps on your toe, you are very quick to snap, you are quick to turn away, you are quick to insult. You are, he knows that we have that propensity in us. And so he commands you and I to abide in love. He knows that if you and I were given the opportunity rather than build bridges, we would destroy, we prefer to build walls. He knows that. He knows that you and I will feel like well, we deserve, we feel like we do not deserve his love. We, he knows because of our sinful activities. I've done all these things, so God does not love me. If, you, if you're talking to a, an unbeliever, you tell an unbeliever to come together, God loves you, say, for God to love you. I say, what are you talking about? For all the bad things I've done, how can somebody still love me? He knows. So because he knows this thing, he had to command you and I, abide in that love. Stay put. Things will happen. Stay. He knows. That's John 21, 15 through uh, 25. He knows that, that he is love. Our mom said before, God is love. It is his attribute. He is love. First John 4, 8, uh, 4, 8 and 4, 16. 1 John 4, 8 and 16. He is love. His attribute is love. And he knows that there will be moments things will happen in our lives. And when those things happen, we will ask us, but where is God's love? What is happening? Why are these things happening? Why am I sick if God lost me? Why is that bill not paid if God lost me? Why are things falling apart if God lost me? He knows those things is happen, that will, they will happen. And that's why he encourages us to say, in spite of all of those things, Despite of all, all, all those things in the account, let your love abide in that love. Remind yourself that I still love you. What are some of the truths about God's call? When God calls us to abide in him, in his love, I mean, when he calls us to abide in his love, what are some of the basic truths that you and I need to know? Number one, it reveals God's great love for you and I. When God calls you and I to abide in his love, it reveals, it shows to us the great love that he has for us. Jeremiah, 
Jeremiah 31, 3, John 3, 16, says, For God so loved. So when he's asking you to abide in that love, he is revealing to you the greatness, the vastness of his love. Number two, the love of God originates in the Trinity. When he's asking you to abide in his love, it reveals to us a truth is that it originates in the Trinity. In Genesis 1, 26, when God, God created everything, right? By the time he came to man, what did he do? He went on consultation. He said, let us. He brought all the forces, the Holy Spirit, and God the Son together. They had to, to show how important, how critical you are. And I am. He brought the Trinity, the love that God has. Comes, emanates, originates from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. G Genesis 1.26, Ephesians 2.18, 1 Peter 1.2. It also shows that the love of God flows outwardly from the Father to the Son and to, from the Son to us. The love of God flows outwardly. Jesus Christ in John 15, 9 again says, the, for my, can you put back John 15, 9? He says in John 15, 9, uh, that, that as the Father loved me, this is Jesus Christ speaking, as the Father loved me, so the love flew from the Father outwardly from the Father to Jesus. And he turns around and says, as the Father loved me, I have loved you. It's an outward this thing. It transfers from the Father to the Son and Son to you and I. Another truth that he reveals that God requires, when he says abide in my love, he requires a response from us. He wants you and I to respond, to, to respond back to that, 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 that command that he's giving us to abide in his love. By way of our actions, by way of our thoughts, by way of the things we, we should respond to that. James 4.8. He also means that as we draw near to him, it's a promise, and he keeps his promises. As we draw near to him, his, he too will draw near to us. John 15, 5. These are some basic truths. Last week, I talked about the three, uh, three keys to, to, to abide. You can, again, be, you have to be intentional. You have to walk by faith, and you have to depend on the Holy Spirit to, be, to, to abide in that God's love. So, that, all of that said, let me ask a question. Question that we need to address. What then does it mean to abide in Jesus' love? What is it? When I read there, it says, abide in my love. What does it mean? What does it mean? What, what actually does it mean to abide in my love? Do you have a quick comment to make? Colossians uh, 1, 10 and 11. That you may walk worthy of the Lord until all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in knowledge of God. Strengthen with all your might according to his glorious power unto the patience of long suffering and joyfulness. Amen. Thank you for that. Uh, I think I have a comment to yes, make. Yes. And uh, in respect of what we are saying, I think uh, we should love ourselves. I mean, the first questions we we'll ask, mm -hmm. we should love ourselves just as what God has said. If you offend one person or if you offend a Christian, then eventually you are offending him. I, 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 and that is true. We love begins with ourselves. How can I go out and give love when I don't have love? Do you know that a lot of us, I can say, and please, no, I, I hope this don't come across offensive, that some of us don't love ourselves. Yes. It's for, people don't love themselves. If you do love yourself, there are many things that you will not do to yourself. You think about it. There are many things that you would do that yeah. we're doing right now that shows that we don't even love our ourselves. Is it not lack of ignorance? A, a, again, let me say this. Ignorance is not an excuse before the court of law. Right? You can have the ignorance. Does that mean that you will, you will avoid the consequences? 
When you come before God, the day you come before God, and he says you failed to keep my commandment, is that, you, do you think it will be an excuse to say, God, but I didn't know their commandment. And then he will allow you. And that is why we're doing these teachings. To help us enlighten, I think it's the Ephesians 1, say, let the eyes of my understanding be enlightened, right? That is the purpose of these teachings. That way our eyes uh, will be opened up, our minds should be transformed so that it can now help us. He said, keep my commandments. But what are his commandments? Abide in me. What does it mean to abide? Abide in me. And who are you that I should abide in you? You start asking all those questions, right? And that's why I said when we did the teaching last, I said, abide in my word. I said, the word of God, this, is not just a historical book. This is not just some written things. It's the active word of God living. So that when you're reading this book, it's like I'm having a communication, just as you and I are talking right now. It helps me to have my communication with God right there and there. God is talking back to me. It's, I'm not just reading some historical thing. No, I am having a constant communication, on the spot communication with God. I speak to him. He speaks back to me. What is he saying? It's a communication, two-way. I listen to him. Back to this thing, for the sake of time. What does it mean to abide in Jesus' love? Number one, it means to abide in Jesus' love means to remain in his love. Not to live, remain, stay, not live. It means, number two, to stay connected, connected to God, not to walk away. Number three, it means to draw life from God. All your source of everything should be God, not the world. It means to receive his grace and be perfected by it. You grow in that grace. In the knowledge of it, that's what it means to abide. It also means to submit yourself to the will of God, to the word of God, to him. It, it, it means to accept his correction when needed. When I do something wrong and he calls it out, we've just learned here this morning that ignorance is not an excuse before him. He does not excuse, exempt you from that. I take that with love. Yes, it's said by my father. So you know what? Let me go and seek knowledge as to making sure that I know his things, the things that he requires of me. By the way, uh, uh, John 15, John 15, let me see what verses... John 15 uh, verses 9 through 16 or 17 talks about God's love, right? If you abide in me, and there are three things that when you read those verses that I want you to pay attention to. Number one is that the source, verse 9. It talks, as, I, I, which I really pointed out, that our love, the love of God is from the three, the, the God, uh, uh, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Triumph God, the Trinity, that love outflows from the Trinity, not just God the Father. So the love is from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's the source. That's where we get the source of our love. John 3.35, John 5.20, John 17.24, 1 John 4.1, and John 3.16. Experience. He is calling us when he says that, but he wants us to experience that love. It's not just to know that the God love is from this place, but to experience that love. Verse eleven. Now let me just hold my Bible here. Verse eleven says, verse eleven. Well, let me say, verse eleven says this. Um, in verse, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. He wants us to experience that joy. Right? It's not enough to know that God loves me. But let me experience that joy. It's an experience. He wants us to capture that experience. And in so doing, we, should, we, 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 we can develop a more intimate relationship with him. Matthew 8, 12. Psalms 42, 7 through 8. And finally, he wants us to put that love into action. If you, look, if you read those uh, verses that I just shared here, verses John 15, 9 through 17, he uses the word commandments or commands about five times. Keep my commandment. If you love God, keep his commandment. So number one, he, from those verses, uh, as you read them, is the source, 
you, you get the source. Number two is the experience that you should experience it. And then number three is to act on those things, act on that love. Now, I talked before about misconception. This misconception we so often hear that God loves us unconditionally. It's true. But I want to share some misconceptions that we can take that statement out of context and do things that we ought not do. God loves us. He so loved the world that he took upon himself to bring forth his child, his only begotten son. Yes, it's true. But let me now caution this. As much as God loved us and he would do everything within his realm, within him, to come for you and I, there is some misconception that is in the church, and I want to address that today. First of all, there is no way in the Bible that talks about unconditional love. You don't see that word clearly stated that this is unconditional love. Let's be very clear with that, right? That is, the Bible talks about perfect love. The, the, the Bible uses words as great love, wonderful love. It does not in any word, I've, I've not, maybe, again, anyone listening to me, if you come across that word, please share that with me, unconditional love. So let's be clear, but it describes love as perfect love, great love, and other descriptions. No, uh, everlasting love. Those are the words that I use. No way does it say unconditional love. The second thing, the second misconception is that when we sit and assume our thing that God loves us unconditionally, that can push us to, number one, begin to tolerate and excuse some of our bad behaviors or bad things or sinful things. You know what? Let me just do commit this sin because God loves me unconditionally. He will love me either way. Let me not come to church because God loves me unconditionally. He will still love me. Wrong conception. That's why I want to take time to address that misconception that has happened to this body of Christ. God makes no demands upon, upon us because of his unconditional love. No. That's what people would think. You know what? God, God loves me so unconditionally that he will not put any demand on me. So you know what? I should live my life the way I feel like. But we just read that if you abide, that is a condition. But people in the church, in the body of Christ, will say, oh, God loves me so much to, to the point that God gave his only son, Christ, to die. So he will do anything for me. Misconception. Just as we talk about uh, Romans 8, 39, it said there's no, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Can sin separate you from the love of God? Yes. Yes. So those are things that we need, we need to be very careful as we articulate these things, as we say these things. All are saved, Right? We can have that misconception that all are saved because of God's unconditional love. Let me, let me ask you, what does John 3, 16 say? say for, though, for, for whosoever, it's not all. He died for all. Is it all that will be saved? As, again, I'm putting emphasis on this so that tomorrow, when you sit there and think that, oh, God loves me unconditionally, be very careful to use that statement. Yes, he loved us. We did nothing for him to send Christ to die on the cross for you and I. But then there are some things he expects from you and I. Amen? God's love is infinite and forever. But that depends on how you respond to it. His love is forever. His love is infinite. But let me tell you, how you respond to that matters. If you negate God's love, if you ignore that love, if you don't accept his son, if you cannot keep to his commandments, you will not enjoy that infinite love from God. So, next question, what prevents us from abiding in God's love? 
couple of few things. What prevents us from abiding in God's love? Number one is disappointment. We so often, we are human beings. We met last time that we're human beings. You pray to God for something, that thing does not come in your way, the, the way you want it and all one not, we get disappointed. Just as you, you are in a relationship, your partner, your spouse, or your children, or those you're relating with, don't do certain things, you are disappointed with them, you walk away. Disappointment. Every time we encounter, or most of the time we encounter disappointment, we walk away from God. We walk away from those partners. We walk away from our people. But I have a solution for you. A solution is to set an appointment with God and pray to God. In spite of the disappointment, have an appointment with God. Mark, four, uh, Mark 6, 46. Anger, 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 anger. When you get, ang when you get angry, we talked here with our sister. The first question that started this morning, our sister referenced anger. When, once you get angry, when people get angry, they walk away. They, 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 they're so disappointed. They chicken out. But I'm here to encourage you, restore. Check, rest the solution, restore your joy. Psalms 51, 12. Restore, say, 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 the joy of your salvation is in God. Number, number three, when we get hurt. So often when you get hurt by people, when you get hurt, disapp disapp when you get hurt by people and all why not, you walk away. How many marriages have broken? How many relationships have been broken? By a simple hurt. People walk away easily. I've been hurt. I just walk away. That's the best solution out there. That's what we think we, we do. But Ephesians 1.6, you can find your solution. Accept, um, accept that love that God has for you. And stay put. That's why he commanded you. Say, abide in my love. He knew that you'll be hurt at some point. He knew that you'll be disappointed at some point. He knew that the, the anger, you'll be angry for things. Say, so in spite of all of this, I'm asking you, I'm not, command, not even asking, commanding you to abide in my love. So, church, with the next few minutes that we have, let's address this other question. Let's address this question. What are some of the benefits that I will get when I abide in God's love? We all look, yes, we human, we want to see something tangible. We want to experience something. Why am I doing these things? Why, why do I have to come to church every Sunday? Why do I have to attend Bible studies? Why do I have to attend uh, 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 prayer sessions? What is there? There must be something in it. Well, we, we, the, when I was, in, while I'm still part of the, I still live in the world, there's a statement in the world, with him, what is in it for me? Why should I do this? The world will do that. The world is so good at that. What is in it for me? So let me ask, when God is asking you and I to abide in his love, what is in it for you and I? What are some of the benefits that we'll, understand, we'll get? First, he says, if you abide in me, in my love, you will be my disciple. John, John 13, 35, please, media team, John 13, 35. If you abide in my love, John 13, 35. If you abide in my love, then you will know that you're my disciple. If I can get that, it says that by this all will know that you are my disciples. By what? By you loving me. By you abiding in me. If you have love for one another, they will know that you are his disciple. So if when I abide in his love, one of the benefits I get is that the world will know that I'm a disciple of God. Number two, you will grow in the knowledge and faith that God's, God loves you. The more you abide in that love, you will grow in that knowledge and in faith that God loves you. First John 4, 7, Psalms 36, 7. You will grow in that knowledge. See, faith comes by, by hearing the word, right? And when you sit and you study that word, you grow in that faith. Your faith grows. When you, when you see a situation where you're disappointed, say, oh, yes, I'm disappointed, but God's love is infinite. Yes, I'm angry. Yes, this has happened. Yes, this has done this, but God's love is still there. You will grow in that knowledge. You will know the magnitude. You will not get the true meaning of for God so loved the world because we so quickly read through that verse and not experience it. 
I did a teaching here on Psalms 23, and I said there was this situation where this young man eloquently read us Psalms 23 in the morning, and they gave him a standing ovation. In the evening, a, an elderly man came and read Psalms 23, and the whole hall was in tears. And when the young man asked, but what happened? He said, because you read the Bible. I read the God of the Bible. I know the God of the Bible. When you feel and experience, know God's love. When you come to John 3.16, you step, you, I told you, you can take six months just to dive into that statement. That one verse alone. For God. Who is this God? What will you say? How is that love? And what is that love? And why me? Who is the world? You start asking yourself questions. You start interacting. Again, I did the teaching, the word of God. When I read the word of God, I'm having a communication, communication with God constantly. I'm not just reading a historical book. It's a communication, open communication. I'm listening to him and I'm talking to him. You will experience confidence and boldness as you look at the coming day of judgment. Uh, first John, media team, help me here, please. First John 14. Verse 7. First John 14, verse 17. You can experience confidence and boldness. If you know that you are abiding in God's love, you will not be concerned about the coming judgment. That's what it is. You will not be concerned. Not be concerned because I already know I'm saved. He loves me and I'm abiding in his love. Why then will I be? If you go around, living a life, not sinning, not committing sin, or not committing a crime, will you be so concerned about the, the law coming after you? No. So if I'm abiding in God's love, I will not be so concerned about the coming judgment because I'm already saved. Amen? Uh, another benefit is that you will walk without fear. First John 14, 18, please. Do. Okay, they say, love has been perfect, perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Right? Because as he is, so are we in this world. We may have boldness. Ne verse 18, please. Could you go to verse 18? Please. Verse 18. There is no fear in what? So if I'm abiding in love, there's no more fear. There's no fear in love. But perfect love that casts out what? Fear. Benefits in abiding in love. You will experience an intimacy with God. I just said that in John 15, 9 through to 17. And experience uh, that intimacy. God is calling us to start in intimacy. Abide. Have an intimacy. And, and, and finally, finally, you will experience intimacy with others. Did he not say that if you love each other, they will know that you are my disciple? So intimacy with God and intimacy with others. Amen. Finally, last question. How do I abide in God's love? I've known all of these things you talked about. This. How then do I really put this in practice? It's in the book of James. Do not just be the hearers of the word. Be doers of the word. How then, after all this said, how do I abide in the word of God? Number one, and I've often started with this. Not anything absent God. Say, so seek ye first the kingdom. You have to have that God. You have to have that relationship. You have to know God. Anything accept that, you cannot be abiding in that love. Right? Number two, you have to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. First John 4, 15. John 1, 1. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Number two, you have to accept and believe that God is love. Until you know that God is love and his character is love, you cannot abide in him. You have to accept that fact. Why will God die for me? Why will somebody die for me? Those are what the world, will, that's some of the questions the world will say. But you and I have been brought to that knowledge. Let me just remind this. So, you, if 1 John 4 8 and 1 uh, 4 8 and 16. You study and meditate on God's love. Take your time. What is this thing about God's love? When he says, For God so loved the world, what is his love? What is his love? Take your time, meditate, reflect on it. Let it sink into you. Number five, you keep his commandments. You say, who said it here? When you know his word, say, keep my commandments. Love each other. Keep his commandments. Do his teaching. John 14, 15. John 15, 10. 1 John 3, 24. 
Number six, live and walk in God's love by loving one another. It's so, so you sit there in church, you sit in pews with people, you can't even say good morning to the person next to you. Anger, bitterness, all of that. What, 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 where is the love? Finally, you want to yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. Amen? Heal yourself. All of these things, we need the Holy Spirit to guide us, to help us. You need to fully surrender yourself to the Holy Spirit. Is it in the Bible? I think Luke, uh, Luke 135, when Mary asked, how can this thing happen? He said, the Holy Spirit and the power of God will overshadow you. When you release yourself and surrender yourself to the works of the Holy Spirit, you begin to abide in love. To continue to be present in his love means that we will not allow our fears, our anger, our pain to bring us down a path of self-destruction. Remember, God's love is this. He accepts us, forgives, comforts, renews, and never leaves us or forsakes us. It's us that live. Father, we thank you, O oh God, Father, for teaching us this morning to abide in your love, for helping us understand the benefits that lie before us or in us for us when we abide in our love and what it takes to abide in you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that from today henceforth, we will be intentional and purposeful, O oh God, grant us that grace to abide in your love. Help us, O oh God. Father, we we'll commit today's, uh, the rest of today's activities into your hands. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.